A Murder of Quality. Adapted for radio by Frederick Gradnam from a novel by John Le Carre. With David Bird as George Smiley, Joan Saunderson as Miss Brimley, and Patrick Barr as Terence Fielding. A Murder of Quality. So, it really is you, Brim. Come on in. Did you think there was another female called Brimley about to enter your life? Oh, what a nice room, George. Yes, yes, I suppose it is. Only it must be years since we last met. It is. Ten years. Ten years. And no doubt you could tell me exactly when and where. I could, but I won't. Oh, do sit down, Brim. May I sit here? Please. Now, tell me, how did you find me? The telephone directory. Under Smiley, George Smiley. Ah. You're the only Smiley G.H. in the book. Then I telephoned first to make quite sure you weren't in, but I was able to leave a message which I assume you got. Yes, yes. Oh, simple, isn't it? The obvious I always forget. Will you have a whiskey and soda? You still drink it? I do, and I will. Fine. You've left the service for good? For good, I wonder. One never knows with intelligence work, I find. <laughs> and yourself, Brim. I edit a weekly paper. Ah, and trust, no doubt, that you have left the service for good. Exactly. Yes, I had another spell some time back. Oh, I didn't know that. Intelligence is all very different now. Ideas are different. People are different. The steeds, jeopardies, feelings aren't about anymore. All gone. Is that the right amount of soda? Thanks, that's just right. Your health, Brim. And yours, George. Fielding. Adrian Fielding had a brother. He teaches at Khan. Yes, that's right. Terence Fielding, a housemaster. That is, if he hasn't retired. No, he retires this half, whatever that means. It was in the Times some weeks ago. You seem well informed. Not well enough. Tell me about Khan School, George. Did you go there? Heavens, no. But you know about it? Yes, yes, I know about it. Is it as bad as it sounds? Absolutely. Not that it always was. It, it didn't become really fashionable until about a hundred years ago. And it was founded by Edward VI in 1550, I think. I've never really understood why some schools become fashionable with the rich, grow like Khan into bastions of snobbery and privilege. It's generally a headmaster. I mean, there's one head who lifts the school up out of the rut and the right people get to know about him, send him their boys, and the tradition begins. Well, there was a man in the 1850s, the master. The Khan calls the head the master. They don't have teachers. They have housemasters, house doms, and ushers. And half? A half is a term. They have only two. What else? Khan itself. I know it's a town in Dorset, but what's it beside? Well, I suppose the school is the term. The playing fields and the staff houses encircle it. It's miles from anywhere, you know, Brent. Beautiful countryside, but quite isolated. Has little to do with the world most people live in. One would have to fit in. Or get out, I imagine. Yes. But that wouldn't be easy for the wife of a house don, would it? What's the problem, Brent? Well... I had a letter sent to my paper the other day from the wife of a man who's teaching at Khan. They haven't been there long. They're called Road, without the H. I see. Oh, what sort of letter? <laughs> I'm a ridiculous spinster, I know, but it's worried me, and I knew you were the best person to come and see about it. Well, you'd better read the letter to me, Brim. Mm, all right. It's addressed from Northfields, Khan School, Dorset. And dated the 7th of February. Dear Miss Fellowship, I don't know if you are a real person, but it doesn't matter. You always give such good, kind answers. There's something very wrong here. I don't know if he's really plotting to... I can't write the word, but I feel as if I'm dead already. Do you understand? It's this place. It's done something to him so that he hates me. No, it's not just my imagination, and I really am perfectly sane and normal. But I'm frightened of everything, of what he's thinking and what he might do. And now the long nights are coming. Please write and tell me what I should do. I hope you don't get many letters like this. Yours faithfully, Stella Road, Mrs. 
Nay, Glarton. Hmm. He is the husband, we must assume. Yes. He can't really be anybody else. And your misfellowship. Yes. Tell me, my dear Brim, what exactly is your paper and how did you get onto it? It's called The Christian Voice and it's a nonconformist weekly newspaper founded in 1903 by old Lord Lansbury. I'm its editor. It's very much a family affair. The same families take it now as did in 1903. The Lansbury we know is the son of the founder. He offered me the job after our outfit was... Thin down in the 50s. Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. And why do you take Mrs. Rhodes seriously? You've had other letters of the same order? No. Only one for a kitchen hints competition and, and a note from her last year saying that her husband had been taken on to the teaching staff of Khan School. We printed the news. The point is, George, she's a Glaston. What is a Glaston? Well, they've been readers of The Voice since it started. The Glastons are part of our magazine, one of the few hundred families who form our establishment. So you take her letter seriously? I must. I know the Glastons are as down-to-earth as you could wish, Stella included. I don't think she's likely to be suffering from delusions of persecution. Well, what are you going to do? Write to her. Ask her to come and see me. You see, I have the idea that Stella's husband isn't the usual calm type. A product of a grammar school, red brick and all that. Yes, yes. And Stella Road wouldn't be the type, would she? I doubt whether Khan has ever had a non-conformist wife. Road himself is also. Yes, he would be, of course. So I shall write to her. And if that doesn't help, well, I wondered, perhaps you could contact the man Fielding for me. Well, I have met him. Of course I would, but... Uh... What's Fielding like? Terence. He's not quite the man his brother was, you know. In his late fifties now, a big man with a fine head, rather flamboyant, a superb natural actor. Is he married? He's uh, not the marrying type. Ah. He's very intelligent, of course, and very vain. Have you met any of his colleagues? Well, Anne knew a housemaster and his wife, Charles and Shane Hecht. I don't remember meeting them ever. I think they were typical of Carl and quite awful. aren't at all the same at Khan these days. I remember before the war when Charles inspected the corps on a white horse. Ah, yes. We don't do that kind of thing now, do we? Of course, I've nothing against Mr. Iredale as commandant. Nothing at all. Oh, he's a good chap, Iredale, when all's said and done. And his wife's such a nice person. Don't you think, Terence? Oh, I don't know, Shane. A bit overdressed for my taste. I know <laughs> what you mean. I wonder why they can never keep their servants. I hear Mr. Rode will be helping out with the corps next half. Oh, poor little Rode. Mm -hmm. Running about like a puppy trying to earn his biscuit. <laughs> he tries so hard. Have you ever seen him at school matches? Well, he ought not to try quite so hard. Do you know, Terence, he'd never seen a game of rugger before he came here? It's, it's all soccer at grammar schools, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember when he first came, Charles? Oh, yes. He's quiet as a mouse. It was fascinating how he lay very low, drinking us in. <laughs> The games, the vocabulary, the manners, everything. Then one day, it was as if he'd been given the power of speech and he spoke our language. It was amazing, like plastic surgery. It was Felix Darcy's work, of course. I've never seen anything quite like it before. Dear Mrs. Rode, so sweet and such simple taste, don't you think? I mean, whoever would have dreamt of putting those china ducks on the wall? <laughs> Big ones at the front and little ones at the back. <laughs> I wonder where she bought them. I must ask her. Shall I ask her? Y you, Terence, would you? Uh, I think not. I find Mrs. Rhoda <laughs> Hell, to be honest, for once. So, they're here next Wednesday. I can't leave them out. Black candles, Terence. <laughs> of course. Here are the coats, Mr. Fielding. Oh, thank you, True. Let me help you with yours, Mrs. Hesh. Thank you, Miss True Body. Poor, dear, sad old fur. Oh, no. It's a lovely coat, madam. Well, thank you, Terence. Extremely pleasant. Oh, you know we're going to miss you when you go. Good night, Terence, darling. So kind. And in your last half, you must dine with us before you go. I'd be delighted. Good night, Mr. Hesh. Oh, good night to you, Miss Truebody. Oh, it's turning very cold, you know. We're going to be having snow soon. Good night, Miss Truebody. Good night, Mrs. Hesh. And thank you for such a delightful meal. 
You must have gone to a lot of trouble. Oh, not really, madam. It's nice to know you enjoyed it. Good night again, Terence, darling. Good night, Shane. Oh, it's damn cold. <laughs> it's nearly the long night, isn't it? It's always supposed to snow at Khan during the long night. And it often does. Oh, do come on, Shane. Oh, Charles, you can quick march your boys as much as you like. I propose to go slow. Good night, Terence. Good night. There now. It was a success, wasn't it, Mr. Fielding? Yes, I suppose it was true. There, that's done. Oh, you look tired, sir. I am a little true. Indeed, I am. Is there anything else, sir? No, nothing else. Sleep well, true. And you too, sir. Good night. Good night. I wrote to Stella Road, George. Today I got another letter, not really a reply, and now I am worried. Which is why you've dropped in again. Yes, frankly. Here, read it for yourself. Right. 15th of February. Dear Miss Fellowship, I am not mad, you must believe that, but I know my husband is trying to kill me. I will come and see you as soon as I can. You do understand that I am normal. I'm so afraid of the long nights. There's something not quite right about him. At night sometimes, when he thinks I'm asleep, he just lies watching the darkness. I know he's trying to kill me, but what can I do? It's not nice, is it? You know, I suppose I should go to the police, but I thought first, would you perhaps see Terence Fielding? Yes, yes, I'll ring him now. I could go down to Calm tomorrow. Oh, thank you, George. I looked up Fielding's number after you were here the other day. Oh. I wonder what the long nights are. Have you any idea? I don't know. It's Ash Wednesday shortly. Something to do with lead, perhaps. Mm, it sounds possible. Ah, Carl School. I'd like to speak to Mr. Terence Fielding, please. George Smiley. No, from London. Mr. Fielding is being got. Good. I wonder just how the husband is trying to kill the wife. Or how the wife thinks he is, rather. I wonder that. These long nights sound disturbing enough, even if you aren't expecting to be murdered. Yes. Maybe Fielding can tell us what they are. Ah, Fielding. Good evening. My name is George Smiley. I knew your brother well. We have, in fact, met. Yes, yes, that was it. Look, I wonder if I might come to see you on a personal matter. A bad time. Or well, what has happened? No, for a friend of mine. She's received a disturbing letter from the wife of a Khan master. Yes, Stella Rowe. Oh. Yes. Thank you, Fielding. Goodbye. Stella Rowe is dead, I'm afraid, Brim. Dead? She was murdered. Late Wednesday night. That's last night. She and her husband had been dining with Fielding earlier in the evening. And the husband? I don't know. Fielding said something. I couldn't quite catch it. George, they'll have to know about the letter. The police, you mean? Yes. Yes, I think they will. You couldn't go down there, could you? To Khan? Well, I suppose I could. But would it really help? I have a feeling it would. All right, then. If you say so, Bryn. Oh, good. I'd better find out who's in charge of the case there. Special branch might help. I'll give them a ring, and no doubt be on my way in the morning. Oh, sorry, sir. I say, I nearly knocked you down. I say, you nearly did. What's the rush about? Sex, sir. Sex. Midday prayers, sir. We say them in the Abbey during Lent. Ah, I see. Is that the East Gate across there? Yes, sir. I'll show you, sir. I had no need, really, to rush, but we always do. Are you visiting the school, sir? Yes, yes, I suppose I am. I hope to see Mr. Fielding if I have the time. Oh, he's my housemaster, sir. My name's Perkins. I'm Mr. Fielding's head boy, sir. Oh, that's what's called a coincidence, isn't it? Yes, it is, sir. You've had a lot of snow here. When did it start? Uh, yesterday, sir. It's a few days early. We usually get it on the long night. This is the gate, sir. Do you? On the long night, eh? Oh, thank you, Perkins. That's the police station just across the road, isn't it? Uh, the police station? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, thank you again, Perkins. And don't be late for sex. Oh, 
come in, Mr. Smiley. I was expecting you. Yes, I'd hoped. I'm Inspector Rigby. Ben Sparrow rang this morning, sir. Ah, that was good of you. Oh, come in, sir. Thank you. Uh, the two of you work together on the war, I believe. Yes. Well, sir, I'll be happy to give you all the help I can. Well, I could do with some myself, the way things are. Anyway, I'm very pleased you've come. Thank you. I believe you've got a couple of letters for me. Yes, yes. I don't know if Ben explained it. Here they are. Ah, thank you, sir. Uh, he told me all about Miss Brimley. Hmm. Oh. Not nice letters, are they? I suppose Miss Brimley is sure of the writing. You can trust her. Aye, so Ben said. She's had other letters about a cake mix and so on from Mrs. Road, and I suppose you can check the handwriting here. Oh, we can, but uh, it's her writing without a doubt. Well, sir, how long are you staying? Well, I don't really know, Inspector. I should probably stay for a day or two just to have a word with Fielding. And go to the funeral, I suppose. I've booked in at the Sawley Arms. Why no tell that? At least something so. Hmm. It's a funny place, Khan. There's a big gap between the town and gown. It's fear that does it. Fear and ignorance. Oh, I can call on Mr. Fielding and Mr. Darcy, and they say, Good day, Sergeant, and give me a cup of tea in the kitchen. Hmm. I don't get cross, but I can't get among them. They've got their own community, see, and no one outside it can get in on it. Yes, yes, it would be like that. There's a lot I'd like to ask them. A lot of things. Who liked the roads and who didn't? Whether Mr. Rhodes the good teacher, whether his wife fitted in with the others. Lots of things. I've got all the facts I want, but I've got no clothes to hang on them. Hmm. Well, if you want me to help, I'll be delighted. But why not give me the facts first? All right, then. Well, today is Friday the 18th. Stella Road was murdered between ten past eleven and quarter to twelve on the night of Wednesday the 16th. She'd been struck on the head. Must have been fifteen to twenty times. It was a terrible murder. Terrible. I'd a guess I'd say she came from the drawing room to the front door to answer the bell or something. And when she opened the door, was struck down and dragged round to the conservatory. The conservatory door was unlocked. I see. It's odd that he should have known that, isn't it? It is that, sir. He finished her off there, out of sight, like. He was wearing Wellington boots, size 10, be around six feet tall from the spacing of the footprints. And covered in blood. Aye. Where was her husband? I'll come to that later. Now, I said there were footprints, and so they were. The murderer came through the back garden. Where he came from and went to, heaven alone knows. There are no Wellington tracks leading away, none at all. A lot of other footprints, so we can be grateful for the snow, but it doesn't help as it might. He left one thing behind him in the conservatory, an old cloth belt, navy blue, from a cheap overcoat by the look of it. Was she robbed or anything? No sign of interference. She was wearing a string of green beads round her neck, and they've gone, and it looks as though he tried to get the rings off her finger, but they were too tight. <laughs> I need hardly tell you that we've had reports from every corner of the country about tall men in blue overcoats and gum boots, but none of them had wings, as far as I know, or Seven League Wellington for jumping from the conservatory to the road. On the telephone, Fielding told me that the Rhodes had been dining with him that evening. Just so. They left Fielding's house in the center of the town at about 10 to 11, walking. Their house is about half a mile away on the edge of the playing fields. North Fields, it's called. That's the place. Well, they got there at about five past 11. When he got home, Road remembered that he'd left a case containing examination papers behind him at Fielding's. So he went back. And Mrs. Road was going to wait up for him. Well, he arrived back at Fielding's about uh, 11.30, collected the papers in their case, and set off home again. At that time of night here, there isn't anybody much about. Road doesn't remember whether he saw anyone. He has an idea a bicycle overtook him, but he's not sure. It was a fine night, cold, a fresh fall of snow on the ground. The light was on in the drawing room. Everything looked quiet enough, very normal. There was a moon, wasn't there? Uh, nearly full. You could see a mighty long way. Well, anyway, he found he didn't have his key with him, so he rang the bell. But he got no reply. So he called to his wife through the letterbox and still got no reply. Then he noticed the churned up snow and footprints going round the side of the house. Did he realize there was blood about? No. He thought it was an overflow from the gutter. It just showed up dark. Well, he followed the marks round the house until he came to the conservatory. No moonlight there, and the light didn't work. Didn't work? Oh, simple enough. The bulb had gone. 
And the conservatory wasn't used much in the winter. Oh, did he light a match? No, he didn't have any. Non-smoker, see. His wife didn't approve of smoking. So he went in, in the dark, calling her name. Then he fell over something. At first he thought it was a refugee parcel. Then he realized it was his wife. There he was then, in the dark, trying to find out what was wrong and then discovering that his hands were covered in blood. He doesn't remember much after that. Poor devil. And then? He was found by a master who lives a hundred yards or so away, Mr. Darcy. Almost out of his mind, his hands and face covered in blood. I arrived there about one. We got him into Dorchester Central Hospital. He's still there. But I gather the shock's wearing off. What is the refugee parcel Road mentioned? Ah, Mrs. Road was the organizer for Khan of parcel collections for a refugee organization. The Public Schools Committee for Refugee Relief, clothes and such like. Very energetic as she was. I see. Now, what fingerprints did you pick up at the house? Oh, Mr. Rhodes were everywhere. The others were made by gloved hands, made before Rhodes. And these examination papers he went back to Fielding's for, were they as important as all that? Uh, yes, up to a point, anyway. The marks had to be handed in by midday Friday. Today, that is. Well, why take them to Fielding's in the first place? Ah, Earlier on, Road had been on chapel duty, so he didn't have time to return home before dinner. He changed to the school, and that's where he left his latchkey, in his other suit. I see. Then how do you explain Stella Road's letters? Oh, it isn't only the letters we've got to explain. Oh, what else? Well, as you know, Mrs. Road was chapel, the only member of the school that was. The minister is a man called Cardew. He knew her pretty well, even before she came to Khan. Well, isn't Road chapel? A was. He turned Church of England when he came here, tried to get his wife to turn also, but she wouldn't. Well, now, Cardew came to see me a couple of weeks back. He was worried and very perplexed at what Mrs. Rode had said to him the day before. He came to see you officially? Oh, he said he wanted to talk to me as a friend and not as a policeman, which meant he wanted to talk to me as a policeman. <laughs> Naturally. And what had Mrs. Rode said? She told Cardew that her husband was going to kill her. In the long nights. She repeated this a number of times. Cardew let her go on, then asked her what put such a dreadful thought in her head. I think he was probably a bit too firm with her. In a way, all she did was to start crying. Not hysterically, just quietly to herself. So Cardew offered to help her in any way he could. Asked her again what had given her the idea. Did she say? No, she wouldn't speak. Just shook her head. Then got up and went to the door. Shaking her head as if in despair, Cardew said. She turned to him at the door, and he thought she was going to say something. But she didn't. She just left. How very curious. She seemed very certain that Rode was going to do it. It wasn't Rode. It couldn't have been. We found the murder weapon in a ditch four miles north of Khan, the morning after the murder. He couldn't have got it there, could he? What was it? Eighteen inches of coaxial cable, two inches in diameter. One of my chaps found it. We are keeping it very close, sir. All right, I'll remember. It is the weapon, I suppose. Everything fits. It's odd, isn't it? That the murderer should have carried the weapon so far and then just thrown it in a ditch. It is odd. Very odd. And I'll tell you two things that are even odder. There's a canal running beside the road for half its four miles. He could have pitched it anywhere along there. We'd never have been any the wiser. The other thing... Mr. Rode used a length of the same stuff in a demonstration lecture on elementary electronics. Mislaid it about three weeks ago. I see. I suppose... Yes, sir? Rode could have had an accomplice. He could. Oh, the papers mentioned a woman you wanted to interview, a mad Janie. Oh, it's a nice thought. Mad Janie is an accomplice. No, I didn't mean that. I just wondered why you wanted to interview her. Well, Stella Rode knew her, see... She was a kindly woman, was Mrs. Rode, easy to talk to. I knew her through being chapel, my wife also. We liked her, most did, although some of the women at chapel took against her, but, uh, well, you know what women are. In a way, Mrs. Rode sort of befriended this Janie creature, used to give her food and clothes. She is what you would call uh, not all there. Happily alienated. Talks to herself and all that. Lives in a disused Norman church over at a place called Pyle, a couple of miles south of Khan. The oldest village in Dorset, so they claim. <laughs> it's a rum place. Half a dozen families all so inbred, you can no more sort them out than a barn full of cats. Well, Mrs. Rode used to visit her in her lair there. That upset some people. Yes, yes. 
And I suppose Mad Janey has vanished. Hasn't been seen in her usual haunts since early Wednesday night on the lane towards North Fields. But that don't mean a thing. These people like Janey are all over the neighborhood for years, and one day they're gone like snow in the fire. But we found a spare set of footprints running along the far end of the road's garden. Woman's prints, by the look of them. Could be Janey's. I hope to heaven they are. We could do with an eyewitness, even a mad one. Well, uh, there it all is, sir. Yes, yes. It's complicated. Really? I'll nose around a bit, Inspector. When I get back to the hotel, I'll give Fielding a ring. He'll probably extend an invitation to dinner. I should like to talk to Fielding. Sherry wine or Madeira, Smiley? Thank you. A glass of sherry. Cards drink Madeira, but boys like it. Perhaps that's why they're frightful flirts. We're all rather subdued at the moment by this dreadful business. Oh, how have the boys taken it? Oh, they adore it. My own house has been particularly fortunate because the roads were dining here that night. Some oaf from the police even wanted to question one of my boys. Indeed? What on earth about it? Oh, God knows. You knew my brother well, didn't you? He often talked about you. Yes, I knew Adrian very well. We were close friends. We didn't see much of one another in later years, Adrian and I... Being a fraud, I can't afford to be seen beside the genuine article. A message from Mr. Darcy, sir. Oh, hello, sir. Have you met Mr. Smiley, Tim? Yes, sir. I ran into him in the Abbey Close this afternoon. Ran into me literally, but apologized in the most gentlemanly manner and showed me the East Gate. Ah, I see. And I suppose Mr. Darcy is going to be a few minutes late. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tim. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, Perkins. Good night, Tim. Musical genius, is Perkins, but a problem in the schoolroom. Darcy won't be more than five minutes, I know him. He's a frightful toad. Looks like a sickered model 50 years after. All trousers and collar. Well, what's his subject? Subject? Uh, I'm afraid we don't have subjects here. Darcy is senior tutor by election... And bachelor by profession, if you follow me. His subject is other people's shortcomings. Stella Rhodes, for instance. Ah. Uh, she was somewhat different from most of the wives here, I imagine. She was everything we are forced to ignore. She was red brick, council estates, new towns, the very antithesis of cars. Yes, yes. Did you like her, Fielding? Not at all, Smiley. I didn't dislike her. I found her rather touching. But, of course, she made enemies. She was too honest. And Khan has no defense against her sort of honesty. Ah, that'll be Darcy. We'll let him have just one glass of sherry. Only one. After all, he has kept us waiting. <laughs> Terence, if I may talk shop for one moment. Perkins' work has been abysmal these last few days. I declare I have never seen work like it. Is he unwell? Has this terrible business upset him? What is it? He never was bright, but really... I don't think he's unwell, Felix. I'll have a word with him, if you like. Tim is a sensitive boy. Perhaps he's upset. Well, do have a little chat to him, Terence, please. I'm so sorry, Smiley, to go off suddenly at such a tangent. It was only that I wondered if this unseemly business could be responsible for the boy's behavior. Oh, yes. yes. You're not suggesting that my head boy had a hand in the murder of Stella Road, are you, Felix? Really, Terence, it was the last thing I had in mind. Frankly and in confidence, I have reason to believe it was her past that brought about her death. Why do you say that? It appears she was expecting to be attacked. Well, go on, Felix. It was her dog. You remember that mongrel they arrived with? Yes. A couple of weeks back, Harriman, the vet, a superior type of person, came to see one of my sister's dogs. He told us that Mrs. Rode had had the dog destroyed the previous day. She said it had bitten the postman. Oh, some long and confused story the post office would view. The police had been round and I didn't know what... Uh, where is all this getting us, my dear Felix? I am coming to the point. She said to Harriman that the dog couldn't really protect. It could only warn. It wouldn't do any good. Wasn't she upset about losing the dog? Oh, indeed, yes. Tears and all. Harriman was rather perplexed, I gather. Mrs. Rhodes' behavior didn't seem to him at all normal. 
Another curious fact was the condition of the dog. Mm -hmm. It had been maltreated, seriously so. Its back was marked as if from beating. Did Harriman follow up this remark she made about not doing any good? He asked her what she meant, but she wouldn't explain. However, I think the explanation is obvious enough. Oh, what? My sister and I talked it over after the death. We decided that Stella Road had formed some unsavory association before coming to Khan, which had recently been revived, possibly against her will. Some violent ruffian who would resent the improvement in her station. No doubt you've seen him lurking in the shrubbery, Felix. Well, oh. how badly was the postman bitten by the dog? But that is the extraordinary thing, the very crux of the story, my dear fellow. The postman hadn't been bitten at all. My sister inquired. The whole story was an absolute string of lies from beginning to end. Glad you came, Felix. Oh, uh, Smiley, just before you go. Yes? That business you rang me about, what was it exactly? Oh, a letter from Mrs. Rhodes just before she was murdered. The police are handling it, but they don't regard it as significant. She seems to have had a sort of persecution complex. So it seems, eh, Felix? Well, good night. Ah, there's been a fresh fall of snow. <laughs> ah, the long night, Terence, the long night. Oh, we can walk up to the crossroad together, Smiley. Unless you have a car. No, I haven't. I mean, not here. Good night, Fielding. Thank you for the evening. You must dine with me if you ever come to London. Do you? I'll let you know. Good night. Good night, Terence. Tell me, Darcy, what are the long nights? We have a proverb that it always snows at Cardin in the long night. That is the traditional term here for the Knights of Lent. It's a beautiful night. Is this Northfield? Northfield Lane. There are several rugger pitches in these fields. That's Northfield. The road's house is over to your right. Looks horribly empty even from here. Uh, my own house is rather larger and lies farther up the lane. Was it along here that you found Stanley Road that night? About a quarter of a mile nearer to my house. He was in a terrible condition, poor fellow. Terrible. From what you were saying at dinner, it seems the Rhodes were a very ill-assorted couple. Precisely. If her death had happened in any other way, I would describe it as providential, a blessed relief for Rhodes. She was a thoroughly mischievous woman, Smiley, who made it her business to hold her husband up to ridicule. I believe it was intentional. Others do not. I do, and I have my reasons. She took pleasure in deriding her husband. And Khan, too, no doubt. Just so. But was she such a problem? Surely her husband could have spoken to her. I never encouraged him to do so, I assure you. Uh, well, this is our parting of the ways. You must come to Sherry before you go. Do you stay long? I doubt it. But I'm sure you have enough worries at the moment. What do you mean? Well, the press, the police, and all the attendant fuss. Ah, yes, just so, quite so. Nevertheless, our community life must continue. I will send a note to the Sawley tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Shall I? Always visit the ground, the scene of the crime. One never knows. Here goes. What's that? The conservatory door swinging. Good God, there's somebody. Or is it a shadow? No. Hello? Who are you? I thought you was the devil, mister. But you got no wings. But you can't do nothing, mister, because I got this holly for to hold you. Yes, Jane. That's a very pretty coat you're wearing, Jane. A pretty blue coat, mister, for to keep me warm from my darling. <laughs> Who is your darling, Jane? I uh, she not be here no more. But she didn't go with the devil, mister. Lay still, she did, with not a word. 
You saw the devil, Jane? There's not many seen the devil fly, mister. But Janey seed him. Janey seed him. Silver wings like fishes he done had. Janey saw. Where did you find that coat, Janey? Him a bad one. Oh, him a bad one, mister. But I seed him flying. Riding on the wind. <laughs> and the moon behind him lighting up the way. Then close the sisters, moon and devil. Flying, was he, Jane? <laughs> Like this, mister. Like this, riding on the wind. Silver wind. Silver. Oh, damn. Now she won't come back. But she saw something. She saw the devil fly, riding on the wind. We found her in the old church at Pyle. I'll tell you about that in a minute, Mr. Smiley. She's made a sort of statement... Now, this last part of it reads like a confession, if it reads like anything. Can you understand it? So I tells my darling, I tells her, you are a naughty creature to go with the devil. But her did not hearken, see? And I took angry with her, but she paid no call. I can't abide there, must go with devils in the night. And I told her, she ought to have had holly, mister. There's the truth. But Janie drove the devil on. And there's one who will thank me. That's my darling. And I took her jewels for the saints to pretty out the church. And a coat for to keep me warm. The coat? I suppose it is the one. Yes, we've traced the woman who gave it to Stella Road for the refugees. Trainee must have pinched it from the conservatory. Did you find any, what she calls, jewel? We found the missing green beads. They were oh. on the altar, on a cross of twigs. The whole place was scary fine. And of course she would go on about the devil, on and on. The devil flying. That's it, flying on the wind. His silver wings stretched out behind him. Like a folk song it is. Do you think she did it? No. Do you, sir? No, of course not. It was quite impossible. But I think she saw whoever did it. Immediately afterwards. That's driving the devil off. But why flying on the wind? And why should he have silver wings? What are you going to do with her, Inspector? Hold her for the moment. I think she's better out of the way, just in case. Yes, yes. The devil must have seen her also. Are you going to the funeral? Yes, yes, I think so. And after it, I might try to get a word with Rhode. On behalf of Miss Fellowship and her paper, if you understand me. Oh, I see what you mean, sir. Yes, that would be a very useful idea. dear Brim. Although they didn't use the abbey, poor Stella Road was given a high Anglican service with a congregation of town and gown. I must say, I prefer the town to the gown from what I've seen of things. But I thought to write you this note just to say that Stella's father was there, a fine, upstanding old man. And I had my first glimpse of Stanley Road, a shallow, ordinary face, a short, ordinary body, black, ordinary hair. The odd thing about him was his impassive, almost too easy manner. Another piece of odd behavior. Fielding at the grave, moving away with an expression of strong distaste as Road came near him, and Road not noticing. I think, for once, T. Fielding was behaving in a genuine manner, but I can't think why he should give himself away, sir. Afterwards, I spoke to Road on your behalf. Quite without emotion, the man was. Anyway, I'm seeing him tomorrow. He's back at Northfield to get some details for a small obituary on his wife, your paper. I hope you approve, my dear Brim. It's very good of you to spare the time to see me, Mr. Rode, in the circumstances. Not at all. You were married at Branksome, I believe, Mr. Rowe. The Branksome Hill Tabernacle. A fine church. When was that? Twelve years ago, last September. Did Mrs. Rowe engage in charitable work in Branksome? I know she was very active here. No. No, not at Branksome. Uh, but a lot here. She had to look after her father at Branksome, you see. Did she take a large part in the social activities at Carm? She did a bit, yes. But being chapel, she kept mainly with the chapel people from the town. 
You should ask Mr. Cardio about that. He's the minister. But may I say, Mr. Rose, that she took an active part in school affairs as well. Me? Yes, of course. Thank you. Now, is there any little fact that you would specially like us to include? Anything she herself would like to be remembered by? No. No, not really. I can't think of anything. No, you could say her father was a magistrate up north. She was proud of that. You've been very patient with me, Mr. Rhodes. We're most grateful on the voice. I say you haven't got a car, have you? No. I mean, I'm afraid I left it in London. Oh. Never mind. I was only going to suggest we went for a drive. Had a chat at the same time. I get a bit fed up kicking around here on my own. I understand. Do you? I don't think many do. Understand the loneliness, I mean. They farmed out all my correcting. What am I supposed to do here all on my own? No teaching, nothing. You think they want to get rid of me? Oh, I'm sure that isn't so, Mr. Rhodes. I know they've done it for the best. But it worries me nothing to do. And my correction, well, well, not being handled as I would. Simon Snow gave one boy of mine in elementary science 61%. The boy's an absolute fool. Perkins is his name, nice enough boy, head of Fielding's house. He'd have been lucky to get 30%. Snow gave him 61%. It's impossible, quite impossible. Yes, yes, it does seem unlikely. I, uh, I suppose, really, I should have moved out of here. The place is getting on my nerves a bit. This house, you mean? Yes. Miss Darcy asked me over to their place to stay, you know, but I didn't feel like it somehow. Not yet. No, of course. Very good people, the Darcy's. Very good indeed. They have a sherry party on tonight. I'd quite like to have gone in a way. Who happened to met, Smiley? Well, the young people in the... Oh, no, they've moved. Oh, there they are, Darcy. Are they the snow? Ah, yes, just so. Simon and Anne Snow. Let me introduce you. Thank you. <laughs> I say, Dorothy, is that Smiley your brother's introducing to the snow? Yes, that's him. <laughs> Strange little blinder. He married Lord Sawley's cousin. Did you know that? Oh. Yes, Lady Anne Circum. She left him soon afterwards, of course. What do you mean, of course? <laughs> you don't know Anne Circum. And now I've seen George Smiley. I wonder if it ever happened. Yeah. Simon's been having an awful time, Mr. Smiley. Felix Darcy unloaded all Rhodes' exam corrections onto him. You mean you have two lots of corrections? I'm afraid so. It's been a bad week. And rather humiliating in a way. Several of the boys who were up to me for science last half are now in Rhodes' form. One or two I'd regard as practically unteachable. Rhodes seems to have brought them on marvelously. Yes, yes. He was talking to me about one boy. Perkins. Uh, he should be pleased with Perkins. The boy only got 15% last half. This time it's 61. Quite remarkable. Whatever else they say about Road, he's a good teacher. Teacher, darling, don't let them hear you use that expression. <laughs> oh, yes. You know, Mr. Smiley, Simon's leaving at the end of this half. Oh, yes, thank heaven. Back to Oxford, a DPhil, and then a university job. You don't like car? Oh, can you blame me? I like it less than the poor Stella Road did, and that's saying something. Shane Hex advancing. You must be dreadfully important, Mr. Smiley, for Darcy to serve decent sherry. What are you? President of the Royal Academy? No, I'm afraid not. Darcy and I were both dining at Terence Fielding's on Saturday night, and Darcy asked me for a sherry. I don't think Terence can be coming. He seemed frightfully upset at the funeral yesterday. Uh, well, it was rather upsetting, don't you think? Oh, dreadful. Stella Road was such a nice person, I thought, and so unusual. She did such clever things with the same dress. But she had such curious friends. Mrs. Snow, I've been meaning to talk to you. I want you to take over Stella Rose's job on the refugees. The master's very keen on refugees. No good, Miss Darcy. We're leaving at the end of this half. I thought everyone knew that. Felix never tells me a thing, old dress. And don't you ask me, Dorothy, darling. You know I'm up to my eyes in all sorts of charity. Refugee? Oh, it all started with the Hungarians, collecting for them. Stella Rose was one of the few wives who did anything. She worked very well, right until her death. I went over to North Fields on Friday with that parson man from the tin tabernacle and card you. Well, to see if there was any refugee stuff to tidy up. And there wasn't a thing out of place. Everything was all packed up and addressed. We just had to send it off. Oh, that was very efficient. Well, it was. 
Now, who the hell can I find to replace her? <laughs> Darling Dorothy. Never happy unless she's organizing somebody. Mostly poor Felix. I suppose I could help. After all, Stella Rose was very kind to us, you know, Mr. Smiley. Yes. Yeah. The only Smiley I ever heard of married Lady Anne Serkham, a very curious match. I understand he was quite unsuitable. I never did hear what became of Anne. She went to Africa. Or was it India? No, it was America. So tragic. I must go. Charles is looking awfully lonely. If anybody deserved to be murdered, that's... Instead, it was Stella. How unjust things are. You said she was kind to you. Oh, very. Yes. Just one thing. When we moved in, into a little house in Bread Street, the rain was simply teeming down. We used a firm called Mulligans. They were absolutely foul. Wanted paying straight away. And I didn't have the checkbook, and Simon was examining for the scholarship. So they even threatened to take the stuff away again. Yes, fantastic. Then Stella turned up. I can't think how she even knew we were moving. When she saw what was going on, she just went to the phone and rang Mr. Mulligan himself. I don't know what she said to him, but she made the foreman talk to him afterwards, and there was no more trouble after that. She was terribly happy to help. Extraordinary story, isn't it? But completely true. Yes, yes. A sort of magic spell. I hope you didn't mind my turning up like this out of the blue, George, but the chance came, and I thought I'd like to see Khan. I can't think how the Christian voice will manage without you for a day, Brilliant. Don't be sarcastic. And anyway, I found a perfectly good young lady to hold the fort, if you can describe the voice as a fort. Well, it's a description that would fit the Sawley Arms. Take where we are now. They call this the residence lounge. <laughs> yes, it's a rather extraordinary echo of the past, isn't it? Inefficient, antiquated, and smug. <laughs> There's a framed tapestry in my room of a Buckinghamshire garden. Even I have forgotten such things once existed, and still do, it seems. The one in my room is of the wild garden of Sandringham. Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> I didn't believe it at first, but it's true. I'm glad you came today. Thank you, George. It wasn't... Road, was it? No, it was impossible. Rigby is keeping one piece of information very close. I can't tell you what, but it lets Road out. Not that he was ever in, not really. Have you any idea why Stella Road accused him as she did? Well, I wrote to you about the minister of the chapel, Cardew, didn't I? Yes, you wrote out everything very clearly. And as you said, cause and effect just don't go together. No reasonable sequence of events. No. Stella's obsession with her death in the long night seems to have been, well, unreasonable. There's one thing, though, Brent. Stella wasn't all of a whole, not by any means. You mean not a sound, sane, nice glasson, a pillar of the voice? There are a number of opposing views about her, in Khan, I mean. Darcy dislikes her and seems to have very good reasons for doing so, which he keeps to himself. And there was the dog that didn't bite the, who was it? Postman. Yes, yes. Well, perhaps she was afraid of someone. But not her husband. Not Rhodes, no. Then at the party this evening, a very nice young couple, the Snows, told me how helpful she was when they moved in, in the town. Came and saved them when the removal men were being difficult. Rang up the owner of the firm, a Mr. Mulligan. Mulligan spoke to the foreman, and all was sweetness and light. What did she say to Mulligan? Well, that the Snows don't know. But Stella Road was of no importance in calm. If she'd been the master's wife, then it would be understandable that Mulligan would kowtow to her. So she must have had something on the man. Yes, yes. It doesn't signify. It only places Stella Road in another light. Now, what was it Felix Darcy said to me? She was a thoroughly mischievous woman. And then he went on to say how she took pleasure in deriding Road, holding him up to ridicule. Road isn't weeping any tears, is he? No, he's indifferent. And it's an indifference which can only come from a clear conscience. About Rhodes' briefcase, George, did he really have to go back to Fielding's for it at that time of night? Was he going to sit up marking the papers until the early hours? I don't know. Presumably he was, but I don't know. I know one thing, Brim. Not that it has anything to do with the murder. What's that? Fielding's head boy, Timothy Perkins, has been cheating in elementary science. Oh, it's obvious. His exam marks were unbelievably high. And the science papers 
were the ones in Rhodes' case. You mean the boy may have had a chance to look at them whilst the Rhodes were at Fielding's? More than likely. You know, George, if Rhodes hadn't gone back for the briefcase, Stella Rhodes would still be alive. And whoever murdered her must have known she was alone. Yes. The Janie woman? Oh, I'm sure not. But, of course, Janie saw somebody or something about the time of the murder. And she stole the beads from the body, like she stole a coat from a refugee parcel. Only that doesn't make sense anymore. Why not? Well, at the sherry party this evening, Dorothy Darcy told me that when she went to the Rhodes house on Friday with Cardio to see if there was any refugee stuff to tidy up, everything was packed up, labelled, ready to be sent off. So Mad Janie couldn't have stolen it, or... Or Janie's coat couldn't have been the one in the parcel. But it was. Rigby traced it to the woman who gave it to Stella for the refugees. And the police found the matching belt in the conservatory by the body. Now, what did Janie say? I took her jewels for the saints, I did, and a coat for to keep me warm. But it all contradicts, doesn't it? Well, unless somebody packed the clothes up after Stella died and before Miss Darcy and Cardew went to the house on Friday. Now, why the devil anyone should do that, I don't know. Good Lord. What? Of course. Whoever killed her must have been covered in blood. He would have needed protective clothing. And to get rid of it... Good heavens. Yes. You must do something for me tomorrow, Bryn, in London. Would you? Of course. I was planning to return tomorrow. Where do you want me to go? The Public Schools Committee for Refugee Relief. I'm sorry to be a nuisance, but a friend of mine asked me to make some inquiries about a parcel. <laughs> My name's Brimley, Miss Brimley. The parcel was from Khan School. It was sent last Friday. Last Friday. Then it would have arrived yesterday. And with luck, I ought to have entered it. It wouldn't have been sent away already, Miss... Uh... Just call me Jill. No, we miles behind. Khan School. Mm, that's off. Let's see. Oh, we're in a flightful muddle. But then if we weren't, we wouldn't be the Public Schools Committee for Refugee Relief, would we? <laughs> oh, here it is. Khan... Parcel post, £27. Oh, good. Is your friend at Calm? Yes. And I bet she's given something to the collection she didn't mean to give. Oh, how clever of you. Yes, at, uh, at least she thinks she has. An old dress with a quite expensive brooch on it. It's the brooch, of course. The Calm parcel should be over here. Sorry, it's a terrible mess, isn't it? Like a mad post office. Parcels from every corner of the country. Every corner that has a public school, that is. Can we have a quick look inside? I mean, you don't have to get permission or anything. Oh, don't worry about that. Now, it ought to be here in this pile. Khan's label has C4 on it. My cousin went to Khan. Oh, he's an utter wet. Did what he told me? Joining Ascot, please. They all... Oh, just a minute. Hello. There we are. Oh, that is clever of you. Let me take it. Oh, thanks. There we are. I say... Calm where they had that dreadful murder, wasn't it? They're holding that mad woman, aren't they? Now, let's open it. Funny. What is, my dear? Well, normally the Khan parcels are beautifully packed, but it's quite different. I take the things out one by one. Awful muddle. What colour dress? Uh, grey. Grey with a few pink flowers. Socks. No duffel. Two black pullovers. Well, honestly, they must be having a brainstorm. Look at these. A pair of filthy old gloves. Leather, I suppose. Awfully stained, aren't they? And look at these. Rubber overshoes. They're pretty grubby, too. Now, oh, what's this? A plastic cake. Bicycling cake. Ugh. Oh, it's damp and slimy. Oh. Uh, yes. Uh, don't worry about me. You look so pale. But no grey dress. No, my dear. There wouldn't be. These are enough. I don't understand. This is all mad. Something very dreadful has happened. I'm a phone. The police will want to know. Leave the parcel exactly as it is, please. Is it blood on those things? Yes. 
I'm afraid it is. Ten. What? Oh, you did give me a start. And you haven't even put the light on. I was just going out. Turning there like a figure in Madame Tussauds. I'm just on my way to Mrs. Harlow. My music lesson. I know that, Tim Perkins. I know which evening it is. Yes, Miss Truebody. Well, I... Tim, what is the matter? I don't think there's anything the matter, Miss Truebody. Of course there is. Ever since poor Mrs. Rode died, you've been going about looking as if you'd seen a ghost. It's not like you. Did it upset you so much? Mrs. Rode? No. No, it hasn't, really. I, I was awfully sorry, but, well, I'd only been to tea with her once. Yes, Tim. I know what you mean. So it's not poor Mrs. Rode. What is it? Nothing. Well, well, it's only the exams. They've, they, they've worried me. I'm not sure if I've done it all well or or if Mr. Rode will see my results. I, I, I mean, um, will you see? I don't see, Tim. Uh, let me tell you after my music lesson. All right. I'll be in my room. Well, thank you, True. Thanks ever so much. Mind how you go on that bicycle. And do be careful at the bottom of Longmead Hill. It's awfully slushy down there. Oh, I'll go as slow as a snail. Give my regards to Mrs. Harlow. I will. Oh, Mr. Foyley, you got my message then. Message? No, Inspector. I was on my way over already. Oh, I thought you were quick in arriving. You've heard the news then. What news? About the boy in Fielding's house, missing all night. No. No, I've heard nothing. Well, half past eight last night, Fielding rang us here. Perkins, his head boy, hadn't arrived at a music lesson with a Mrs. Harlow who lives over at Longmead. Neither had he come back. We found him an hour or so later at the bottom of Longmead Hill. Half in the ditch, his bicycle beside him. Dead. Oh, my dear God. We've closed the road and we've been trying to reconstruct the accident. Looks as though he must have fallen from his bike near the bottom of the hill and hit his head on a stone, his right temple. How did Fielding take it? He was very shaken. Just seemed to give up. And then he broke down and asked to be left alone. How do you mean, broke down? He cried. Wept like a child. I would never have thought it. I suppose it was an accident. I suppose so. Perhaps, Inspector, before we go any further, I'd better give you my news. That's why I came to see you. I just heard from Miss Brimley. She's been looking at the contents of a parcel. Yes, there is the refugee relief place at York Square. No, I'm not sure. I'm only hopeful. Yeah. Yes, fingerprints on all surfaces. Yes. I'll come up with the 425 this afternoon. At 8.05. Oh, one last thing. I'll be bringing some samples of a schoolboy's handwriting and an examination paper. Yes. I'd like the opinion of a handwriting expert. Thanks. See you later. It's a funny sort of jump in the dark, that one of yours, about Perkins. Well, I've no idea yet what it might prove. But that bicycling cape in the parcel looks like the answer to Jane's silver wings in the moonlight. Someone riding a bike with a plastic cape flying out behind him. Yes, the devil riding on the wind. Hmm. I shall have to let Janie go, I suppose. I wouldn't, Rigby. Keep her with you, so long as you can possibly manage. No more accidents, for heaven's sake. We've had enough. Then you don't believe Perkins' death was an accident? Good Lord, no. And nor do you, do you? I put a detective onto it. This is a clever chap we're up against. Everything devised to the last detail, even the weapon you found where you did. Stella Rhodes' murder was a murder with clues cast to mislead. A murder planned to look unplanned. And somehow, poor young Perkins got in the way. Or more likely, knew something. Without knowing it, if you see what I mean. Uh, God knows what. Except it was important to the murderer. All right. I'll keep Janie in. If you find any fingerprints on the stuff in the parcel, will you have anything local to compare them with? Well, we've got Rhodes, of course. And Janie's. But not Fielding? As a matter of fact, we have. From long ago. But nothing to do with this kind of thing. Oh, it was during the war. His brother told me, up in the north of England. It was hushed up, wasn't it? Yes. So far as I've heard, only the Darcy's know. And the master, of course. 
Some Air Force boy. Yes, yes, that was it. Well, I'll be off. Good hunting in London, Inspector. Are you making any calls or anything, sir? Well, I was thinking of dropping in at Fielding. Mr. Fielding's very upset, sir. He told me he didn't want to see anyone, but I've said you're here, sir, and he'll be in shortly. Would you like me to take your coat? Yes, yes. Thank you. All right, Drew. Yes, sir. Smiley, what do you want? I just wanted to say goodbye, Fielding, and to offer you my condolences. Well, goodbye. Thank you for calling. You needn't have bothered, really. You could have sent me a card, couldn't you? Well, I could have done, yes. But it just seemed so very tragic when he was so near success. What do you mean? What the devil do you mean? Well, I mean in his work, the improvement. Simon Snow was telling me about it. Amazing, really, the way Road brought him on. Goodbye, Smiley. Thanks for coming. Well, not at all, not at all. I suppose poor Road must have been bucked with those exam results, too. I mean, it was more or less a matter of life and death for Perkins passing that exam, wasn't it? He wouldn't have got his removed next half if he'd failed that science paper. You must have helped him wonderfully, both of you, you and Rose. Oh, you've heard the latest, I suppose, about that wretched gypsy woman who killed Stella Rose. They've decided she's fit to plead. Or just between ourselves, Fielding, I don't believe she did it. Do you? I don't. No, no. Khan killed them. It could only happen here. It's the game we play, the exclusion game. Divide and rule. Now, for God's sake, go. You've got what you want. Go. Go. Oh, come on, <laughs> Fielding. There's a fire here. Now, sit down. Good. Good. Now, listen. If what I think is true, there isn't much time. I want you to tell me about Tim Perkins, about the exam paper. He would have failed, wouldn't he? Yes. have had to leave. The day the Rhodes came to dinner, that day Rhodes left his case in the hall. It was unlocked. But you know that, don't you? Perkins took his chance, and later, when you asked him how he'd done in the exam... He wept. He wept as only a child can. And he told you he'd cheated. That he had looked up the answers and copied them onto his paper. And after the murder of Stella Rhodes, he remembered what else he'd seen in the briefcase. Is that right? No. Don't you see? Tim wouldn't have cheated to save his life. He never cheated at all. I cheated for him. You? But you couldn't copy his handwriting. It, it was only formulae and diagrams written with a ballpoint pen, the kind we all use. Don't you see, Smiley, it was easy. His paper was hopeless. He'd only done two out of the seven questions. So I cribbed five answers from the science book. He was in the case, too, and wrote them in. Then it was you who opened the case. You who saw... Yes, it was me, I tell you. Not Tim. He knew nothing. And when Stella was murdered, you knew who had done it. Yes. I knew Road had killed her. Yes, yes. And what exactly was in the case, beside the papers? A sheet of transparent plastic. It may have been one of those pack-away cape things. An old pair of gloves... And a pair of homemade galoshes. Homemade? The hack from a pair of Wellington boots, I think. Was that all? No. Uh, there was a length of heavy cable, I presume, for demonstrating something in his science lesson. It seemed natural enough in winter to carry waterproofs about. Then, after the murder, I realized how he'd done it. Did you know why he'd done it? Road was drunk with the pride of Khan. This had gone to his head. It must have hurt him terribly that Stella wouldn't take any part in the power and glory, wouldn't share any of it. The night they came to dinner, the night she died, she upset Road. I never told anyone this, but she did. Road was full of a sermon the master had just given. Hold fast to that which is good. Well, Road went on and on about it. He couldn't take too much drink, you know. He wasn't used to it. She kept quiet till he'd finished, then laughed and said, poor old Stan. You'll always be Stan to me. I've never seen anyone so angry as he was then. He went quite pale. I've watched her, too, at meals and dinner parties elsewhere as well as here. I've watched the way she'd peel an apple. Oh, you know what I mean. Well, she must have seen how people do things here, but it never occurred to her she ought to copy them. 
I admire that. So do you. I expect that Khan doesn't. And Road didn't. And I think he grew to hate her for not conforming. He came to see her as the one factor which would deprive him of a great career. He couldn't divorce her. That would do him more harm than being married to her. In the eyes of Khan, Road knew that. So he killed her. He plotted a squalid murder. With his little scientist's mind, he fabricated clues. But something went wrong. Tim Perkins got 61%. An impossible mark. He must have cheated. And to cheat, he must have opened the briefcase. And then he must have seen the cape, the boots, the gloves, the cable... So Road killed him, too. Yes, yes. Thank you, Fielding. I'll have to let Rigby know. Yes, let the sergeant know. I'll have to face the music about the cheating. I feel much better now, anyway. Much. Oh, I sent a chap round to collect Road. He should be here any moment. And no arrest, just a chat. Why the hell didn't Fielding tell us about this before? Oh, well, that's what I'm wondering. It could be that he didn't understand the significance of what he saw until... Until what, sir? Perkins' death, I suppose, Rigby. And that doesn't add up. The handwriting blokes of the yard are convinced that the whole exam paper is in the same hand. Is Fielding a liar, then? Yes, yes. The most accomplished liar I've come across for a long time. <sighs> Road could have done everything. He could have dressed himself up in a plastic outfit, killed his wife, then put the cape and things in the refugee parcel. Having done that, he plays the part of the distressed husband. The only trouble with that pretty picture is how he made the weapon fly through the air into a ditch four miles away. It just doesn't work. And would he have had the courage to go back in there, playing the distressed husband, knowing that mad Janie was about? If he did know. Were there any fingerprints? Not a one. And the blood on the gloves and on the length of cable are of the same blood group, which was still a road. Nobody knows that you found the weapon, or when you found it. Nobody outside my squad, and yourself. I think I'd better send someone round to Feely and get a full statement, lies or not. May I suggest something, Rigby? By all means, sir. Speak to Road first. Ask him about the briefcase. As an opening, I mean. And you'll stay, Mr. Smiley? By all means. Hmm. What motive would Fielding have had? To lie or to kill? Both. I wish I really knew. Oh, come in. Mr. Rhodes, sir. Oh, come and sit down, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you. I'm sorry to drag you along like this, but there are just one or two things I'm not clear on. Oh, by the way, you know Mr. Smiley, don't you? Yes, from the voice we met the other day. Mr. Smiley is helping us. <laughs> I didn't feel he was really from the voice. You didn't quite smack of the tabernacle, Mr. Smiley. Well, Inspector, how, how can I help you? This business of the briefcase with the exam papers in it. The case I went back for? Aye. It was awful about that boy. A nice boy, but he was very stupid. I suppose he found the case in Fielding's Hall and opened it and copied the answers. He could have only got that mark by cheating. Ah, I should have locked it, of course. What else was in the case, Mr. Rhodes? What else? Well, only the papers and the book with the questions and answers. Uh, Henderson's Elementary Science, it's called. Well, you've seen the case, surely. It's only a little one, about 18 by 12 inches, uh, six or seven inches across. Well, why did you leave it behind? Was it absent-mindedness? No, not really. I could have sworn Stella was carrying it as we stood in the hall saying goodbye. It wasn't until we got home that she asked me what I'd done with it. She asked you what you'd done with it? Yes. And then she threw a temper and said I expected her to remember everything. I didn't particularly want to go back. I could have rung Fielding and arranged to collect it first thing next morning. But Stella wouldn't hear of it. She made me go. You should have told me this in the first place, Mr. Rood. Well, you see, I, I didn't want to tell anyone about our quarrels. I, I wanted to keep the truth about Stella to myself. But then... But what, Mr. Rood? Well, you must suspect I killed her. And anyway, by now, a lot of people here in Khan know what Stella was really like, the truth about her. You mean that she was not a very nice woman? <laughs> it was her father, old Mr. Glaston, who first told me. When I said I wanted to marry Stella. I never thought to hear a human being talk like that of his own child. What did he say? He said she was bad. Bad in her heart, that she was full of malice. He told me how she'd lead people on, all kind and warm, till they told her everything. Then she would hurt them. Say wicked things, half true, half lies. He told me a lot more besides. 
Well, go on, please, Mr. Rhodes. Of course, I didn't believe him. I just thought him a lying, jealous old man who wanted his child to wait on him until he died. So I married Stella. And when did you discover her father was right about her? Well, the realization just crept up on me after a year or so, little things here and there, but... No, it wasn't until we came to Khan that I knew what her father had said was really true. She hadn't been very keen on chapel before, but as soon as she got here, she went in for it in a big way. She knew it would look wrong, that it would hurt me. She wasn't sincere. A lot of people at chapel knew that. Mr. Cardew, the minister, knew. He understood why I gave up chapel. I couldn't bear to see her going there every Sunday and going down on her knees. It was all wrong. It just made a fool of your faith. All she wanted to be was different, to spite the school and me by playing the humble one. My wife and you were at chapel, you know, Mr. Rode. Yes, I know that. But your wife never gossiped. Stella said that. They made her cross. Because to begin with, people liked her and they talked to her. She listened. Oh, she loved to listen. And she hoarded away every drop of gossip and dirt. She'd come home sometimes after her chapel work in the evenings and throw off her coat and laugh till I thought she'd gone mad. <laughs> I've got them. I've got them all. I know all their little secrets. Uh, those that realized what she knew, they grew to be frightened of her. Did she have a hold on a man called Mulligan? Yes. Yes, how did you know that? He's got a daughter with an illegitimate kid near Leamington. Stella found out. Well, that's how she helped the Snows when they were moving in. She told me about that. She rang up Mulligan from the Snows and said, Greetings from Leamington Spa, Mr. Mulligan. We need a little cooperation. And he cooperated. But they got her in the end, didn't they? They got their own back. Yes, they got their own back. Mad Janie didn't do it, Inspector. No, Janie's as soon have killed her own sister as killed Stella. They were as close as uh, moon and stars. That's what Stella said. She looked after Janie. You see, it gave her a feeling of power to help a creature like Janie and have her forming around. Not because she was kind, but because she was cruel. Was she cruel to her dog? You know about that too, do you? Oh, yes, yeah, she often beat it. But one day, she beat it until it was... Oh, poor brute. She must have got mad. Well, I couldn't take that. I took most things. I, I had to, you understand? I... I had to, unless I left Khan. But that, I shouted at her. She laughed. And then I hit her. Not hard, but hard enough. I gave her 24 hours to have the dog destroyed or I'd tell the police. She took it to the vet the next day. I suppose she told him some tale. She could always do that. She said it had bitten the postman, Mr. Rode. Not very original. And she was found out by Miss Darcy. Ah. And the Darcy's understood about her. Yes, Felix Darcy. Well, that was strange. Anyway, after the business of the dog, she took to pretending I was violent, cringing away whenever I came near, holding her arm up as though I was going to hit her again. She even made out I was plotting to murder her. She went and told Mr. Cardew I was. Did you know that? Yes, sir, we knew that. Well, she didn't really believe it herself. She'd laugh about it sometimes. Then at other times she'd whine and stroke me, begging me not to kill her, not to kill her in the long night. It was the words that got her. The long night. She liked the sound of them, the way an actor does. You were going to say something about Darcy. Darcy? Oh, yes. Yes, he knew about Stella, but not because she had anything on him. No, that was something different. She had something special there, something she'd never told me about, you see. There were nights when she'd slip out, all excited, as if going to a party. Quite late sometimes, 11 or 12 o'clock. You didn't ask her where she was going, Mr. Rule? No. No, I never did. You see, if I had, she'd have enjoyed not telling me or telling me a lie. I only knew she was going to meet somebody she had on the hook. Darcy must have known who it was. She said he did, but he couldn't tell. <laughs> she liked that. Well, that was all I ever knew. Hmm. Have you any idea who killed her? You know I didn't, don't you? Yes, or you think I know that, sir. But you don't know who killed her. You don't know yet. I think we know who killed her, Rod. I think we do now. What the hell do you want with me again, Smiley? I thought you'd gone back to London. No, I didn't go back. After all, something cropped up. Here, I mean. You had to do some more of your wretched little spying, did you? No, not spying, Fielding. Talking. Talking to Rose. Yes, I heard the police had pulled him in. Not pulled him in, Fielding. 
They've just been getting his story. Well, thank you for telling me, Smiley. It's most interesting, but you needn't have bothered. I'm not concerned any longer with road or any of this dreadful, sordid business. At the end of this half, I leave Khan for good. Wash my hands of the place. Goodbye, Smiley. The story you told me yesterday, when I came and saw you, about cheating for Tim Perkins, how you took the paper from the case and altered it. Yes? It isn't true. They've examined it, and it isn't true. The writing was all one person, the boys. If anyone cheated, it must have been Tim Perkins himself. My dear Smiley, you can't expect me to believe that. These policemen are practically moronic. And what does it matter? Tim is dead, isn't he? Road killed him. Uh, look, Smiley, I think to do. I have to go to London tomorrow. Do you know why? I'm seeing a headmaster about a job. I've no pension when I leave here, you know. I have to go on working. I shall have to teach at a crammer's, a sort of breaker's yard for old dons. Don't you feel sorry for me? Isn't it a nice sensation to feel pity for an old fake like me? Of course, it doesn't necessarily signify anything. I mean, you could be protecting the boy, couldn't you? By lying for him, even though he's dead. For his honor, so to speak. Is that the explanation? I've been playing to an empty house here at Khan, you know, Smiley. They won't remember me for more than a half or two. What a mess I've made of life. That's all there is to it. You've got to listen, you know, Fielding. There might have been collusion between you and the boy. A situation where you were moved by the boy's distress when he brought you the papers. And on the spur of the moment, you opened the case and took out his paper and told him what to write. I told you the truth yesterday. Make what you want of it. I'm trying to help, Fielding. I beg you to believe me, I'm trying to help. I don't want there to be more trouble than need be, more pain. I want to get it straight before Rigby comes. It matters terribly about the briefcase. Everything hangs on whether you really saw inside it and whether Perkins did. Don't you see that? Sit down, Smiley. What are you trying to say? If it was Perkins who cheated after all, if it was only the boy who opened the case and not you, then they'll want to know the answer to a very important question. They'll want to know how you knew what was inside it. What was inside it? The plastic cape, the gloves, the galoshes, the piece of cable. I saw them. They have to believe that. They were the things, even if that police sergeant hasn't been able to find them. Oh, don't be so silly, Fielding. Everything's been found. It was all in a refugee parcel. All but one thing. Well, Road had every opportunity to do that, put things into one of Stella's parcels afterwards. Well, let's start from the other end. Suppose it was you who killed Stella Road. Suppose you had a reason, a terribly good reason. Suppose you went ahead of Road after giving him the case that night, overtaking him by bicycle. Suppose Janie saw you, like she said, riding on the wind. Then feeling. If that were really so, none of those things were ever in the case. You must have made it up, all of it. Of course, later, when the exam results came out, you realized that Perkins had cheated. Then you knew he had seen inside the case, had seen that it contained nothing, nothing but the exam papers. And he could have told the police that. That would explain why you had to kill the boy. I hear you. Because you did kill him, didn't you? You waited for him at the bottom of that hill. Twice a week he came down it at the same time on his way to his music lesson. You must have stopped him and then hit him with a stone. It looked like an accident. It looked as if he'd fallen off his bicycle. Poor Tim Perkins. That was a terrible thing to do, Feeling. And it nearly broke you, didn't it? Shut up, for God's sake! Shut up! And why should I have killed Stella Road? What was the reason you spoke of? Oh, I think it was like this, but... One thing for certain first. When you were convicted, the RAF boy, in the north of England, the magistrate who convicted you was a Mr. Glaston, Stella's father. So she knew about that. It was the sort of information she would hoard and use. Rhoda's told us the truth about her. She was dreadful, wasn't she? Evil, Rhoda called her. Really evil. Go on, Smiley. She came and told you what she knew. That was all. But she had you on the hook, as Rhode calls it. You spoke to Darcy about her. Darcy knew of your conviction, and he suggested you played along with her to discover what she really wanted. So she summoned you to meetings at absurd times and places, in woods and disused churches, at night mostly. And she wanted nothing from you but your will. 
She made you listen to her boasts and her mad intrigues, made you fawn and cringe. At least, I believe it was like that. Although she also had the power to stop you getting another job, and she tormented you with that. You planned to kill her feeling. And then on the night when the case was left behind, you saw your chance, and you took it. Did I? Did I? And how did I know Road was coming back for the case that night? It was part of Stella's little game. She left it behind purposely, and she arranged that you were to visit her after Road had collected the case. She made him go back for the case. Then she sat there, waiting for you, Fielding. It was a perfect opportunity. There was only the slight risk that Road might have recalled you riding past him. But bicycles are common in car, and with a plastic cape on, you might have been anybody. Sheer fantasy, Smiley. I saw what was in that briefcase. I told you Road must have done it. Of course, you're quite right about her blackmailing me. But she did many worse things to other people, and not least to Road himself. They know Road didn't do it, Fielding. The point was that she could have stopped you getting any job in any school. And I think she would have done. Or if she'd let you obtain a job, then she would have still had you on the hook. How do they know Road didn't do it? How can they know? He's got no alibi. Why should he have made all the bother with the case? Why didn't he keep the case with him all the time? To do what he did do with it doesn't make sense. But never mind. If he did leave the case behind, so he had a chance to put on his killing outfit without hurry, without Stella suspecting, then he did have a sort of alibi. But actions like that don't make sense, Fielding. Why not? How do you know? How do you know it wasn't Road? I'll tell you. Five minutes after discovering the body, Road was with Darcy. From then on, for the next 48 hours, he was under constant supervision. Perhaps you didn't know this, Fielding. But next morning, the police found the murder weapon where you dropped it that night, four miles down the road in a ditch. Road couldn't have got it there, could he? In five minutes. No, of course not. Bad mistake, wasn't it, Smiley? Why didn't you throw the cable in the canal, where it would never have been found? Did you so much want to incriminate Road? It would have been poetic justice. It was Road who brought the frightful woman here to Khan because he nursed a miserable little ambition. He wanted to be one of us, the stupid oaf. So he let her loose on Khan and on me in particular. Didn't he guess what she was up to, what she was really like? Road knew. He knew all there was to know about her. He suffered because of her, but he never murdered her. No, I did that. She got her just desserts. And you know, Smiley, if I hadn't done it, somebody else would sooner or later. She'd have tormented some other poor devil. That's what she liked about it, of course. I rang the bell that night and she came to the door full of herself, ready to put me through her catechism. And then she saw that I was going to kill her. For a moment she showed fear, for a fraction of a second only. She made a mouth as if to scream, but she didn't utter a sound. Then, just as I was about to strike her down, she looked up at me and there was no surprise in her eyes. I never thought I would make a murderer, you know, Smiley. Perhaps Stella Road would have made one out of any man. I imagine Rigby is on his way. Yes, he should be here soon. How very civilized this all is. I suppose she'd have let me get the job of that awful crammers just to keep tracks on me. She'd never have let go of me. She loathed me and everything I stood for too much to let me slip out of her life. Oh, those meetings I can't describe them. It wouldn't be decent. But I shall never forget them. And I shall have plenty of opportunity to remember them, shan't I? Could you have stood her treatment, Smiley? Surely it was as bad as any treatment by a secret police. The sudden grab, the smooth release, and then the sudden grab again. No end to it. Don't you see I had to kill her? No, Fielding, no. Because I think of what followed. Tim Perky. How old was he? Seventeen. And he cheated probably for the first time in his life. And paid for it with his life. I try to forget that. To kill the thing you love. God help me. And now True will answer the door and say, Good evening, Mr. Rigby. What can I do for you? Oh, good evening, Mr. Rigby. What can I do for you at this time, Mr. Peeling? Mr. Peeling, please, Mr. Wally. I think you have somebody with you, Mr. Tiny. Yes, I know. Is this Mr. Walker? Yes, sir. Good evening, Inspector. I have a warrant for your arrest, Mr. Peeling, on the charge of murdering Mr. Stella Road on the night of February the 16th. I know, I know, Inspector. Oh, Mr. Peeling, you can't let them say such things. Poor true. The Inspector's quite right. 
On the night of the 16th, I killed Stella Rose. No, you're just saying that, Mr. Fielding. You couldn't murder anybody, not you, Mr. Fielding. I never thought I could either, True, but she made me a murderer, you know. And then I had to go on. Go on? I don't understand. Oh, no. No, not Tim, not Tim. You loved him. I saw him off that night. I told him to be careful. Come on, for heaven's sake, let's get this over with. I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. It always has been, Inspector. Goodbye, Smiley. I'm sorry I'm not a patch on my brother. Goodbye, Fielding. You know, they'll never be able to live this down at Khan. Things will never be quite the same again here. That is something to be remembered by, isn't it? Quite something. Patrick Barr played Fielding, and David Bird, George Smiley, in Frederick Radnum's adaptation of A Murder of Quality the novel by John Le Carre. Peter Williams played Inspector Rigby and Joan Sanderson, Miss Brimley. Michael Spice was Road, Pauline Letts, Miss Truebody, Brian Hewlett, Perkins, Dennis Hawthorne, Darcy, Delia Payton, Dorothy Darcy, Maureen Beck, Mad Jaydee, Elizabeth Cassie, Jill, Claire Davenport and Edward Jewsbury, Shane and Charles Hecht, and Jill Carey and John Pullum, Anne and Simon Snow. A Murder of Quality was produced by David Geary. The Sunday play at half past two on Radio 4 tomorrow is John Drinkwater's classic, Abraham Lincoln, starring Michael Horden and Mary O'Farrell. Half past two tomorrow afternoon, Abraham Lincoln.